good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN. We're a nonprofit that presents programming exploring human development across the lifespan. I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Aisha Roscoe and Natalie Moore. Thanks for joining us tonight. FAN's YouTube channel has an archive of over 300 videos of past events, so be sure to subscribe to the channel to get updates when new recordings are posted. And now for some introductions. Aisha Roscoe is the host of NPR's Weekend Edition Sunday and the Saturday episodes of Up First. A host of the Morning News Magazine, she interviews newsmakers, entertainers, politicians, and more about the stories that everyone is talking about or that everyone should be talking about. Prior to her role as host, Roscoe was a White House correspondent. She covered three presidential administrations, I'm sure the stories she could tell, gaining a reputation for her sharp questioning at the White House briefing room. As part of the White House team, she was also a regular on the NPR Politics Podcast. And now Natalie Moore, who we're thrilled to have back, is an award-winning journalist based in Chicago whose enterprise reporting for WBEZ tackles race, housing, economic development, food injustice, violence, segregation, and inequality. Her most recent book is The Billboard, a play about abortion published by Haymarket Books. Her acclaimed book, The South Side, A Portrait of Chicago and American Segregation, received the 2016 Chicago Review of Books Award for Nonfiction and was BuzzFeed's Best Nonfiction Book of 2016. A program note, Natalie has interviewed ta Coates, Jasmine Ward, Thomas Fisher, Christian Cooper, among others for FAN. We love her and we're grateful for her engagement with our programming. Also, in case you don't know, Aisha and Natalie are both proud alums, as you can see there with Natalie, uh, both proud alums of Howard University, so I'm sure we're going to hear a few stories there as well. So now let's welcome Aisha Roscoe and Natalie Moore. Good evening. Thank you for having me, Fan. It's always a treat to be here. And I have never met Aisha until tonight, even though we are in the public media family. So welcome. I'm so glad to be here. I'm really excited. I got my headset on so I can hear you clearly, you know, but uh, yeah, so I, I I might look like I'm at McDonald's, but that's okay. I'm doing work. I'm working just like everybody else. <laughs> right. Um, so let's just start with, tell us why you chose Howard University. That's a good question. Um, you know, I I knew, and I, I, I write about this in the book, I knew that I wanted to go out of state. Like I knew that I didn't want to stay in North Carolina. I was a very shy, introverted kid, and I wanted to be able to kind of define myself outside of the parameters of the people that already knew me, right? Like I wanted to be able to get out. And so it was down to Howard. And then I also applied to Ithaca. I'm not really sure why I applied to Ithaca because I don't really like, I like snow, but not to be out in it. So I, I don't know exactly why I applied to Ithaca, but I applied to Howard. I mean, Howard was always the standout because to me, it really was the Mecca, right? Like it, and it felt it felt cool. It felt like a place where I felt like if I could make it in at make it at Howard, I could make it in DC, then I could make it anywhere. And it just had this mystique to it. You know, it was, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the inspiration for Hillman College at, for in a different world. And, and I just felt like Howard was a place that I wanted to be and I wanted it to be my home. Um, and, and that's where I ended up. Well, let's take a step back and talk about where you grew up and what your schooling was like. We FAN has so many partners um, with a lot of schools in the region and a lot of private schools. So what was your educational journey before Howard? Well, I, you know, I'm a public school kid. I mean, my you know, I always say like my mother, I never felt like she really was like looking at like the school district. She wasn't like one of those people. She was just someone trying to make it. She was someone trying to survive, put food on our table. Right. And I think that she kind of felt like with me, I think she kind of felt like wherever you put Aisha, she going to be all right. You know, <laughs> like I was the type of kid I would do my homework on my own. And I pushed myself like I ended up being an all A student just because that's what I wanted to do. I just liked it. I did. Well, and I also didn't have any friends. So that helped. So not having friends, not having a life. My whole life was just school. Um, and so in North Carolina, obviously, you still 
have kind of the vestiges of segregation, but the schools that I went to were pretty integrated. Um, I would say most of them were about 50-50, um, black and white. Um, the school that I graduated from was majority black and Hispanic. Um, but there was still that thing where you kind of have this internal segregation. If you're on that honor school you're, or that honor student track where you're in the AP classes or the honors classes where you still end up in classes where you may be one of the only black students or, you know, one of a handful of black students. Um, and so I definitely experienced a lot of that where because I was a quote unquote academically gifted, um, I still ended up in these places where I, you know, did not look like everyone else. And as you were thinking about, okay, so you mentioned, you know, Howard's this Mecca, um, but what, what drew you to an HBCU experience? And with that, what did you expect versus what was it like when you got on campus? Mm. You know, I think I was always open to an HBCU. Growing up in North Carolina, like basically there's an HBCU. Aren't, aren't there more you, HBCUs in North Carolina than any other state? I thought that, but I did an interview recently and I oh. think it's actually like Mississippi or Alabama. One, I was wrong. Oh. I thought it was North Carolina, I thought but it was it's North not because we have okay. a whole bunch. But, you know, my mother went to Winston-Salem State. Um, she, I think she's probably listening to night she want me to say that um, and a lot of my aunts and uncles went to Winston-Salem State my sister went to Winston-Salem State um and so which is an HBCU my brother eventually went to Shaw University so uh, I, I it, it was definitely in the family and something you know so I went to I grew up going to homecomings with my mom and seeing her and her friends and seeing the majorettes and and all and so I knew that experience I think for me I felt like Howard was an HBCU, but to me, it was like, it, it was bigger. And because it had this alumni base where, you know, you're talking Toni Morrison, you're talking Zora Neale Hurston, you're talking, you know, Isabel Wilkerson, you you know, um, you know, Thurgood Marshall. And so, you know, Felicia Rashad and Debbie Allen and, and the list goes on and on. Like when I looked at the people that had gone to Howard, um, the 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 impact that they had on the world, it was definitely something where I felt like if I can go and kind of walk in their footsteps, like if 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 they could, you know, if I can go to the same place they went to, then you know what, you know, maybe I could also be somebody. Maybe I could also, you know, do something with my life. So I think it was it was the reputation. And it was, you know, this legacy that I felt like Howard had um, that made me just want to go. And then also going to the campus, uh, what really solidified it was going to the campus, standing on the yard, seeing like the Delta strolling by their, you know, special tree, seeing all of these just like beautiful black faces. And it was just like, this is where I want to be. I want this to be home. So you and I were not there at the same time, um, many, many years of a, of a gap, but we both worked for the Hilltop, mm. the student newspaper named by Zora Neale Hurston. I don't know. Am I going to see you this weekend in DC for the centennial? I want to be there. I am kind of tired from all of this, but I want to be yeah. there. And I feel like I've been talking about the Hilltop so much. I'm like, I have to be there, but your girl is a little bit tired. I'm not going to. Okay. <laughs> promote the book of I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. Okay. I want to be there. Well, um, it's this is the hundredth anniversary of um the Hilltop's founding, and this is where you really you write about where you felt like you found your community. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, if I do get up this weekend, the reason why I will get up is because the Hilltop is really where I. I definitely found my journalistic voice. I mean, it's where I learned journalism. Like I did, I, you know, I knew I wanted to be a journalist since I was in middle school and, you know, I did a whole bunch of stuff in high school, but, you know, getting on the hilltop, I always say like journalism is something that you learn by doing. Um, and I felt like when I was at the hilltop, it was like you were just thrown into this, um, you kind of thrown into the ring, right? And you just kind of had to hit the ground running. And at that time, my junior and senior year, we were actually daily. 
um, for my junior and senior year. And we were the only daily um, Black uh, HBCU news school newspaper um, and really one of the only daily Black newspapers in the whole country, professional or, or collegiate. Um, and so it was something where I learned how to push um, for information. I learned it toughened me up, um, you know, because people would get upset about what we reported on. Um, it forced me out of every comfort zone because I didn't like going up and talking to people. Um, and it, it, it just it, it, it showed me what it meant to be dedicated. It showed me the importance of reporting because it had an impact um, and it and it showed me like what it what it meant to be a journalist. And, and so so much of that I've taken with me and and the journalist that I am now, the seeds were planted when I was at the hilltop. You mentioned earlier, and you write about this too, about, um, you know, you said you didn't have any friends in high school. Did you really <laughs> not have any friends? I didn't have, no, I didn't have no friends. It was me and Jesus. Yeah, it was me and Jesus. And like, <laughs> like, I mean, so I moved around a lot. I had, I definitely didn't have anyone I talked to on the phone. I did like my junior and senior year, I was at a the school that I was at, I worked for the student newspaper. And so within that space, I was cool with people at school, um, but we didn't hang out outside of school. I, it was me and the Lord. <laughs> so at Howard, how did you, um, I don't know if it's come out of your shell. I don't know if that's the right <laughs> phrase to describe it, but how did you find community? That's that is a great question. Um, I I when I wish I could say like when I showed up at Howard, it was just like, yeah, I was no longer shy and just totally out of my shell. That didn't happen. I was still pretty shy, but like you know, at Howard, I I learned what it meant to be a friend. So like, I had my roommate, and then I had my sweet mates. We were at the annex, and I don't know the Bethune annex at that time was just for girls. Um, so I wasn't at the quad. I don't know if you were at the quad. I was, I was at I, the quad. You were in the quad. Okay. So I wasn't in the quad. I was in the annex. So I didn't have to share, you know, showers with a whole bunch of people. I was very happy about that. Um, mm -hmm. we just had our little suite. And so within my suite, I ended up making my some of my best friends and and one of my best friends to this day. Um, it was like Dallas and Keisha. And me and then, you know, uh, Natalie, and we just had our own little crew um, other with other girls on the floor. And like with them, I kind of learned about what it meant to be a friend, what it meant to have friends, because you're living with people. Right. And it's like, you know, you're learning about, you know, fighting and people getting into getting into it. But also you're learning about. Like, okay, girl, you need to arch your eyebrows. I didn't know about that. <laughs> you know, we're sitting around watching Law and Order all day. And it's just like going to that 24 hours McDonald's every every night. Um, and it was just, it was fun. Like, but I, I will say it was a time that meant a lot to me because I really hadn't had that. Like it was something that I had desired so much. I I, you know, I had my family, I had close family. Um, that I loved and always supported me, but I, I didn't have friends. And so I really learned about friendship at, at Howard University. And of course I had friends on the Hilltop. What were your positions at the Hilltop? So I started off writing for the campus section, which I felt like was, um, you know, I feel like that's the top you know, the A section to me was a campus section. The hard news section. The hard mm -hmm. news section. So I started off as a contributing writer. Then I was a staff writer. I can't, I think definitely by sophomore year, maybe I was a staff writer. And then I was campus editor my junior year. And then I was editor in chief the se my senior year. Okay. Well, I was editor in chief my senior year also. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so a lot of this comes out in the introduction of the anthology, um, but I'm wondering when you decided to do an anthology, were you thinking this is for parents who may be reluctant? This is for counselors. Uh, this is for high school students or all of the above. What 
audience were you trying to reach? I really, I really truly wanted it to be for all of the above. Like I wanted this book to be, and I, I do got it here. It's a little bit. I wanted HBCU made, I hold it up. I wanted, <laughs> I wanted HBCU made really to be for everyone. Like, so of course I wanted it to be for those high school students who want to know what is the HBCU experience like. But I also felt like even for me as someone who went to Howard, like putting together the book, I was surprised reading other people's stories. First of all, I was surprised by like how many through lines there were, how much, you know, continuity there was, even though these are all very different people from very different backgrounds and different schools. There were all of these traditions at other schools that I had no idea about. Um, so I learned a lot, like, and it touched me, even though I would say that I, I felt like I knew a lot about HBCUs. I learned a lot. So I, I felt like it would be great for people who went to HBCUs. But also I feel like and, you know, as I put it together, what I really recognize is that a lot of these stories, you know, are stories. Um, yes, they are about the institutions, but the institutions are made up of people. And so these are very human coming of age stories. And um, someone actually tweeted this yesterday. And I think they put it better than I could put it is that. You know, he was like, I didn't think this book was for me. I think he was like, I'm a white male. I, I didn't know this book was for me. And but he was like, but it sounds like this is really about people finding out who they are. Um, and so this is, and, and I absolutely agree. Like, these are the stories of people, you know, finding themselves as young adults and what that means and what that journey is. And yes, it's about these institutions, but it's the people that make these institutions. So they're very human stories. Um, so that I think that, you know, this is a book that is really for everyone. That's a good way to put it, people finding themselves. But as you decided that did you ever at ever any point think, well, I'm gonna write a memoir about my HBCU experience? Or was it always an anthology that you wanted to do? <laughs> no, I, I will say this. I I never thought I was gonna write a book. <laughs> but I and I definitely didn't think I was gonna write about my experiences because I'm like, you gotta put that in the vault. Um, but but I always loved Howard. And so I loved Algonquin came to me and said, would you want to do put together an anthology of essays, you know, including your own stories about why going to an HBCU um, made a difference in your life? And so that was very captivating to me because it wasn't just a story about like my own personal business, even though I did open up about that. But it was really a story about like why going to Howard um, made a difference in my life. And that was a story I was ready to tell. And then also what stood out to me was they said this hadn't been done before and that no major publishing company had um, put out a story, you know, put out an anthology where HBCU graduates in their own words told their own stories about why these institutions mattered. And to me, that was shocking. I, I could not believe that this had not been done. I mean, it, to me, it was like, this is a no brainer. And so and that is very surprising. Yeah. yeah. I, so I was just like, how how can that be? Um, and so when they said, no, we searched around and we couldn't find it. And so I said, well, give me a month. Let me think about it. Cause I got a lot on my plate. I got three kids. I had just started um, you know, hosting Weekend Edition Sunday. Um, but when I thought about it, I, I couldn't let it go. And I said, you know, this is something that matters to me. This is something I'm passionate about and I really want to do it. And so I'm so glad I did. After you decided you were going to do it, how, how did you decide who was going to be in it? What were you looking for in the contributors? I wanted a very wide range. I wanted one thing that was very important from the beginning was I wanted a wide range of HBCUs. I didn't just want, of course, you know, we could fill up a book with just Howard, you know, <laughs> we, could fill, we could fill up a book with just Howard, but I didn't want it to just be Howard Morehouse Spellman. I wanted it to be, um, because there are about a hundred HBCUs in this country um, and not all, a lot of them don't get the name recognition. So I wanted to make sure that we weren't just talking to the schools that, you know, are more well known. So I wanted the Talladega's rec uh, 
um, represented. I wanted the Morgan States represented. I wanted Dillard. And so I wanted to make sure that we had a wide range of schools. I also wanted to make sure we had different generations. So, you know, we had, you know, some of the people a bit more seasoned. They've been, you know, they can, they went uh, a little while ago. And then we have our youngest, Brandon Gilpin, who is an actor. Um, he was at our New York event earlier this week. He graduated from Morehouse in 2021. Um, and so I wanted like that range. And then, you know, I wanted people from different backgrounds who had had, you know, some people who maybe grew up on a college campus, others who were like the first in their, um, you know, in, in their families to go. And so I wanted, wanted all of that sort of range. I want to spend some time talking about through lines because that's something that came up for me. And the through line that I came away with is that I felt like most of these stories were a reflection in stories about the South. Mm, you think so? I didn't, I haven't thought about that. You feel like there's stories about I the did. South? Oh. Yeah. Because so many HBCUs are in the True. South. Very true. Um, you can debate whether, I mean, I think Howard, I mean, East Coast considers himself yeah, yeah. North, <laughs> even though North Carolina is on the East Coast. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yes, you have your Hampton, mm -hmm. Howard, Morgan Dillard. State. Yeah, yeah. You know, de um, you know, Delaware, you know, some schools, Coppin State, Lincoln in Pennsylvania, but most of the schools are in the South and they oh, exactly. were started mm -hmm. deliberately in the South, you know, after slavery. So I was, I felt like these are stories from the South. Mm. Well, I mean, I think that that is true. Like, I think when you think of, um, you know, the, the, the schools that we have represented, whether it's Dillard, Southern, um, you know, so, so many of them, Tennessee state, um, you know, Hampton, I, I think, you know, you're absolutely, and, you know, Hampton's in Virginia, I think that you're absolutely right, that there is definitely, um, that is a part of it, like that Southern, um, and the story of the South, the story of the South coming up through, um, you know, segregation, although that was all over the country, but the very specific, and I'm growing up in, in, uh, North Carolina, you feel like the the impact of Jim Crow. I mean, even in 2000, I wrote in the book, the school that I went to, one of the high schools that I went to still had a segregated homecoming court. So they had, you know, a black homecoming court and a white homecoming court. And that was because of integration um, and, and it had never changed. Um, so there is this feeling where the past is not far away and and you have these institutions there that are still dealing with all of that. And Anne Marie put in the chat um, after we thought that North Carolina had the most H HBCUs, it's actually Alabama. Alabama, okay, yes, yeah. <laughs> that North Carolina is the state with the most Black HBC undergraduate students enrolled. Oh, so we weren't okay. too far off, but you know, I think about Mississippi and all of its schools. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why. And I I think that I was drawn to that because I think so many people are dismissive of the South. Like, oh, it's backwards. Or, oh, how did they vote this way? Or, mm -hmm. you know, all these tropes and dismissiveness mm -hmm. of the South. And mm -hmm. so I guess for me, it was, here are stories from the South that um, fly in the face of what people think about the South, but these stories are told through, you know, this last, these lasting institutions and this legacy. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, when you, when you put it that way, I hadn't thought about that, but I think that it is, it is so important. And my story is, is, and my story and others in the the book I mean, it is a story of the South. Um, it is a story of, um, and it, it's a story of, you know, this idea of what it means to stand out, what it means to be an authority. I mean, I'm someone who is on public radio and I have, not only do I have a Southern accent, I have a, a Black accent and people are very quick to tell me. <laughs> um, and like, they don't expect someone who sounds like me 
um, to be in this position. And I think, but what I will say is that, you know, growing up in the South, you know, listening to my mother, my aunts, my grandmothers, you know, all of my family, all I heard was, was wisdom, right? All I heard was um, people who knew what they were talking about. And I, and I never felt like it was um, robbery for me to think that I could stand up and say what I'm talking, you know, and and sit, feel confident in the way that um, that I speak and know that I am worthy to be in position. Now, I didn't always feel that way, but I think that like going to a place like Howard and seeing so many different types of Black people and seeing them be successful as themselves, it helped me to know that at least for me, it made me feel like. I don't have to change who I am and that I am worthy as I am and that my humanity should not be questioned. Um, like I, you know, like I said, it was a process. I don't want to say like, I just woke up overnight and I just had it. I still don't have it. I'm still learning. But I think that over time, those were the sorts of, sorts of things that I was able to learn and to grow um, and to develop. And I think a lot of that started at Howard. And there's a certain amount of, I think, confidence that, Howard and other HBCUs get. I mean, you you brought this up. I was going to ask it later, but you know, we'll <laughs> we'll go, we'll get back to that. It's all related, though. But you don't have the um, how does someone put NPR, you know, public radio voices, um, the honey coated eggheads. That's how <laughs> they sound with that soothing. And then you come on. And it's like, it just upends what people think. And listeners, I remember, listeners feel very passionate about, because they think you're taught the intimacy of radio yeah. and audio. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was new to public radio, someone called me and said, or left a message and said, I really like your stories. They're so interesting, but I cannot stand your voice. And when mm -hmm. you come on, I turn you off. And it's like, wow, somebody really... Mm -hmm said that and you have had so much criticism on the cesspool that Twitter can be um how have you I mean it sounds like Howard helped you with that confidence to stand in who you are how do you deal with that kind of negativity um I, you know and I wrote about this you know not to be a shameless plug but I wrote about this for l.com um and it came out this week but I think that like I think that what Howard helped me with is to understand the context and that when people are coming at me about my voice, it really isn't about me. Like it's not, it's about a larger thing. Like it's about systems that have been in place that have said, this is what authority must look and sound like. Right. And so it's yeah. really not about Aisha Roscoe. It's just that I am not used to this. Um, I get, and I want to say too, mo uh, the vast majority of the audience has embraced me so much and I have appreciated it. Um, but yeah, there are some people who, and to this day, I will get people saying that I'm too loud, which I always found very weird. Cause I'm like, it's the, you can turn well, it up or turn it down. I'm like, well, they, I mean, they say it all the time. You're too loud, <laughs> but I, you control the sound. Like you can turn it up, turn it down. And you know, I'm obnoxious. I sound like a rapper. I'm like, how do I a rapper. A, a rapper? Yes, I wrote a coded hey. language. Basically, it's like you sound so black <laughs> yeah, on my yeah, NPR station. That's what they're saying. Yeah, it was like you sound when I you sound like a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? That's a good one. Yeah. I mean, so it's I get that sort of thing. And of course I get some that are just like, you, you're not smart and you're lazy. That was, you know, the other big thing is you are lazy. You're not trying, right? Because you're speaking the way you're speaking. You can't be trying. And I'm like, no, I work really hard. Like, what are you talking about? I work really hard on my delivery. I work really hard at what I do. So it depends on the day. Some days I can let it just roll off my back. Other days it really gets under my skin because I'm a human being. But I think 
like I said, what Howard did was just give me the context to understand what is really trying to be said. And it also gave me the context. And I start off the book with this quote from um, from Toni Morrison that says, you know, uh, you know, the the goal of 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 ra- of racism is distraction. Um, and so times when I've wanted to defend myself and defend my intelligence, because, you know, they'll say things like, I'm pretty sure you're smart. I'm pretty sure you're like, as if it's open to interpretation. <laughs> and I, you know, like the times when I've wanted to defend myself and say, look, I've, I've interviewed presidents. Like I've done it. I go, wait a minute. Why am I going to waste my time defending yeah. myself? to some as if my intelligence is up for debate and it's not up for debate. I'm not debating you about this. Um, And I've been able to say, I'm not gonna be distracted by this. This is a distraction. I'm not gonna spend all my time trying to prove to you that I'm somebody, I already know. Um, and so those are the sorts of things that I've had to take with me, but some days it's, it's easier than others. You know, some days you won't get that block button real fast. <laughs> so my through line was the South. What were your through lines? I felt like a lot of what I saw over and over again in the book. And, and like I said, when I asked for essays, I, I didn't direct, I didn't say, you know, do this or do that. Um, but I told people to kind of write about those things that were were most meaningful to them. Um, but what I found was community. Over and over again, I saw like the power of the HBC community, HBCU community. Um, whether it was you know Tendai Kumba, who is a Broadway dancer, um, who um, talks about um, going to Spellman and getting into a horrible accident and how the Spellman community rallied around her um, and supported her. Um, and, you know, as she was nursed back to health and now she's on Broadway, um, you know, whether it was, you know, um, Roy Wood Jr., um, his story to me really was- His, a- his was one of my, my favorites yeah. in the- in the book. Yeah. I mean, his is about community, but it was also about redemption. Um, yeah. So and, Robert Jr., Comedy Central, yeah, went Comedy to C- Florida A&M. Yeah, went to Florida a- 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 A&M, and he got into trouble with the law. He got into trouble. I mean, he says, you know, he stole some jeans from Dillard's. But anyway, he got suspended. Uh, from school and he had to go to FAMU professors and basically ask them to vouch for him to give him a second chance so he could get back on campus. And he talks about how getting that second chance at FAMU um, really um, set him on a path now. So now you see Roy Wood Jr. um, at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, you see him at the Emmys, but it was at FAMU where he really got his second chance. Um, and you see other stories with people who are lesser known, um, you know, Marquise Brown, who's a digital marketer. He um, talks about how, you know, he wasn't a really good student in high school uh, for many reasons. And then he kind of, he got to Hampton, but um, he had to take remedial courses. Basically Hampton gave him a shot. He wasn't the greatest student. He got in. Um, and how seeing a black male mathematician um, who was his tutor and how that made such a difference to him. It opened his eyes to see what was possible. And he was also learning from someone who was not judging him, who didn't make him feel like you're a failure or maybe you just don't know anything because you're black. But he was able to just feel like, okay, I'm going to learn this. And then he ends up graduating from Hampton with honors. And so you also see, so it's, it's community and redemption that I saw over and over again. Um, And then I also saw diversity um, because I think a lot of times, and I'm sure you've heard this, there's this idea that HBCUs are not diverse, that basically they're not representative of the real world because you go there, everybody's the same. But Black people are not monolithic. And you go to an HBCU and you see people from all over the world, um, you know, from the Caribbean, from the continent of Africa. You see, um, you know, people who are very rich. You see first generation college students. 
Um, you even a very funny story. Um, Lauren Ellis, who does a lot of special effects and things and big, big uh, superhero movies. She talks about on Hampton and her first day she ran into her first black Republican. <laughs> so, you know, it's like you see like there are all sorts of people on campus. And I think you that was brought up in so many of the essays, just talking about the diversity of the black uh, college experience. That was something that uh, struck me going to Howard because before I, I, you know, from Chicago, went to public school, South Side, um, mostly black and, you know, some Latino, not a lot of white students. And when I went to Howard, I thought, oh, black family reunion, everybody's black. And then it was like, oh, yeah. I have an accent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you're from you you from Chicago. You one of those Chicago people. People, people think I'm country. <laughs> Especially if they're from New York. They're like yeah. from the South. I'm like, no, nah. oh no. Nah. Okay. Well, I guess oh, yeah. I see why you why you say that. Um yeah. and yeah, the diversity with I mean, there was a Haitian student union, mm -hmm. Caribbean, African. Why why people from, from California sound a certain way? How they yeah. and you see this show up mm -hmm. um, aesthetically before mm -hmm. you, know, you get to know people. It's like oh yeah, you know the the fashion can the can music. You know, I mean, we're in the DC. Music. You yeah. hear the go go. I never heard go go in my life. Didn't know anything about that. I really didn't even know much about like you know Caribbean reggae. Any any I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> much about that yeah. um so i mean it's so many different things that you learn or that i learned um and i saw that the they expans were just the expansiveness of blackness yes yeah yeah um and that and i think to me that solidified and i know that it can sound like such a simplistic point but i think that so much of what um is dealt with obviously there's just systematic things but I think like on a personal level it's like that's so much of what can be dealt with is just like the fact that like black people are human they are all sorts of black people there we are not you know robots where we are people and people can be all sorts of ways and like there is a freedom in that and like understanding that and like so nobody can tell me like oh well black people are like no you don't know black people because I've been around black people and black people are all sorts of ways and so if you're trying to convince me that black people are somehow just naturally inferior or, or naturally you know you know derelict or naturally I'm gonna say no I know that's not that's not true and you really don't know black people because we don't all think the same and we all are unique and because we're all human um and i think that that's what hbcus reinforce over and over again but a lot of your writers didn't shy away from some of the challenges uh. that are on hbcu campuses which are not unlike challenges anywhere else in America. And so I appreciated that classism, colorism, homophobia, this desire to be included if you're excluded shows up. Can you talk about the the thorns mm -hmm. that showed up in some of these essays? Yeah, and you know, I think because I, I'm a journalist, I never wanted this book to be PR. I never wanted it to be fluff. I always, and, and when I wrote to people, I said, I want this to be a love letter, but I want to be clear that love is complicated and that I don't believe that, you know, and, and that just because you love something doesn't mean that it's perfect. And love often means, um, you know, saying that you hurt me um, and that you can do better. Um, and I love you enough to tell you that. And so um, we have essays like from Michael Arsenault, who's a New York Times bestselling author, also a Howard graduate. Um, and he's a, a gay black man. And he talks about how the homophobia that he faced and that the homophobic attacks that happened on HBCU campuses while he was in school and and the the impact that that had on him um, and how he loves Howard and he loves that experience, but he wants these schools to love him just as much as he loves them. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that was very important 
to have that story in there, to have that discussion. Um, and there was, you know, people talk about the respectability politics um, and how often on these campuses you can see. Can you explain what that means to yes, you, you may not know? I think for respectability is this idea that if Black people present themselves in a certain way, maybe suit and tie, dress a certain way, talk a certain way, wear their hair a certain way, that they can be accepted into society. Um, that if they present themselves in a sophisticated manner, um, and often that means, you know, pretty like standard, you know, cis heterosexual, <laughs> you know, cookie cutter way um, that you can be accepted and that you can be successful. And that in some ways, HBCUs can absolutely reinforce um, those ideals. They can reinforce misogyny as, you know, as women, women should act a certain way. Don't sleep around. Don't be, you know, this is the way you should be. Don't dress like you know, don't be a hoochie mama, <laughs> you know, like this idea of like, if you just carry yourself, you will save yourself. Um, and I think that there's been a lot of pushback against that idea that, you know, dressing or talking a certain way will save you. And, you know, when I was in school, it wasn't uncommon um, that you were told, look, if you go for an interview, make sure your hair is straightened, make sure you don't have no braids, make sure you don't have no long nails, you know, all of these things that were basically saying, look, don't be too black when you go up in there trying to get a job. And I think that some of that was obviously just the idea that, look, this is the society we live in and we have to kind of conform. But I, I am so glad that you see people pushing back on those ideas with the Crown Act and other things to say, no, I can show up as I am. I can show up with locks. I can show up with braids. I can show up however I want to show up. Um, and that shouldn't take away from my ability to do my work because it doesn't. BCUs are politically right now. You know, I, I think about, especially after George Floyd, um, I think there was an uptick in students wanting to go to HBCUs, which have I think I mean there's some schools that have always attracted students mm -hmm. like a Howard, but there was a decline in the 80s, you know, with integration, and then different world comes on in yes. the late 80s, it goes up. Um so where do you think HBCUs are what's the current state of them politically? I think that they are still getting a lot of attention. I think you had, you know, the racial, so-called racial reckoning after George Floyd um, and the conversation about the need to support our own institutions. I think you had, and this is a big, I think you had Beachella, you know, you had Beyonce really, you know, promoting the black student experience at, at Coachella and the student and the marching bands and all of these things and giving scholarships to HBCUs. Um, I think that you have Kamala Harris um, and in the White House, uh, a Howard graduate. Um, and I think so. I, I do think and now. Um, we are in a moment where affirmative action has effectively been overturned um, by the Supreme Court. Um, and so I think that you do see a renewed attention on HBCUs. You also see massive donations, um, $100 million to Spelman. Uh, I believe that was just last week. Um, and so you do see a renewed attention. Now, at the same time, I think uh, you will all you see a an attack on quote unquote DEI um, diversity equity and inclusion. I think that HBCUs um, are not going to be immune to that idea because there is this idea where when you see efforts to make the society more inclusive, that that is that very idea is under attack at the moment. Um, and that you have people looking at any sort of any person, any black person or person of color in a position and saying, look at this DEI. What's going on here? How, why are you here? Why do you belong? 
Um, and so I think that that is something that I don't think will, you know, um, stop at the HBCU door. I think that this idea, even though HBCUs are not, they do not segregate, they, they, they allow white people in, white people have always been allowed to go to HBCUs. Um, you know, I, I think this, this fight will continue, um, you know, just like people always are mad that it's Black History Month. Why is it Black History Month, not White History Month? <laughs> you know, I think so. I think in that same way, you're still going to see that sort of fight. Um, and I also think that, you know, the Biden administration has talked about how HBCUs, especially the land grant universities, have been underfunded and intentionally underfunded by billions of dollars. And that's billion would it be billions of dollars. Um, and so even though you're getting some of these massive donations, they're not going to all of the schools and a lot of the schools are struggling. So you have um, so it is a difficult time. Can you talk a little bit about what it means to be a land grant school in HBCU? Well, I mean, and now don't get me to saying something that it's not. <laughs> but I believe a land grant uh, institutions, I believe, are supposed to get a set amount of funding um, uh, from, I, I believe, from their states. And they have intentionally been, they have not getting, gotten the money that they are owed. Um, and some schools have sued over this, um, but yet they are owed money that they have not received, um, that states have not given them that they deserve. Um, and so these would be public institutions, institutions that are funded um, by um, state government. So that's so these are schools that are owed money, not from you know alumni or donors, but from the government that they have not received. Going to Howard, it's in a very urban environment. There really are no, the campus parties are at the club, <laughs> downtown. Yeah. Uh, what are some traditions that maybe we missed out on or that you learned from these essays? You know, what I loved, like when I read about Spellman, um, I, I didn't realize like all of the and, and, you know, Spelman is obviously an all women's um, <clears throat> school, one of two um, all women's uh, HBCUs in the in the countries. The other is Bennett. Um, <clears throat> and so I, what I learned about is how they wake up the freshmen um, at, at like four in the morning and they have them all in the chapel singing songs like in their bonnets and their curlers, like singing the school song and like quizzing them on the school history. I was like. I had never heard of this. <laughs> I was like, really? And then, you know, they graduate and then they're all white and they walk under the tree and they're arm in arm with their, you know, sister who's like becomes their their partner who walked. I It just sounded so beautiful. I had never heard of these traditions. Um, and I was just like, this must be. Um, you know, a really good essay because, and I, and this was from Tendai's Kumba, who went to Spelman. Um, we also have Stacey Abrams wrote about Spelman because she's a Spelman, um, uh, alum, alum as well. But like I said, you know, this made me almost think, should I have went to Spelman? <laughs> like, which is very high praise from someone who went to Howard, you know what I'm saying? Really? So it was really? just like hearing, like seeing like these beautiful, um, you know, traditions. Like I, I just loved it. And, you know, really seeing, um, you know, I've always been a fan of like majorettes and bands. So having Branford Marsalis talk about um, going to Southern University and being in the band, he could have went to Juilliard. He could have went to all of these conservatories. And he said, no, I'm going to Southern. I want to do their type of marching band style. Um, and, you know, hearing like his stories of that, like I just... I loved hearing that. And then we have a, a majorette um, who uh, she was one of the first dancing dolls at Southern University. And like, so that style that you're seeing from Beyonce and stuff at, at Beachella, um, that came from like the dancing dolls and other majorettes. So I, I just loved hearing all of those stories and, and, and hearing about all of those traditions. There are probably a lot of parents who are um, on this webinar. And I, mean, I think you've made this point throughout our time so far, but there may be parents who are worried, maybe worried is too strong, but um, 
are still trying to understand the value of an HBCU mm -hmm. because we know they're under resourced or mm -hmm. is it like the real world? The whole world mm -hmm. isn't black. Should my child go here? What would you say to those parents who maybe have questions? I would say that HBCUs are absolutely like the real world, um, that you learn, as we've talked about, uh, that you meet a wide range of people, that you learn how to deal with a wide range of people. Um, but I think that what HBCUs offer um, is a safe haven where you aren't constantly having to defend your humanity. Um, you are able to grow and develop, not in a perfect environment, but you're able to grow and develop without constantly having to defend why you're here, why you belong here, why you deserve to be here. And you're able to just kind of figure out who you are. Um, and I think that one undersold point, and, and this comes up in a lot of the essays, is that there are so many connections at HBCUs. And it's not just like if you, we both went to Howard, and so that's a connection. But if I meet someone from FAMU, if I meet someone who went to Morgan State, like there is an HBCU camaraderie um, that you see where, and over and over you see in the book, where people get a help helping, you know, kind of a leg up because they knew someone else who, or they meet someone else in the industry who went to an HBCU. So there are lots of connections. And I think that when you look at, you know, um, a Natalie Moore, when you look at an Aisha Roscoe, when you look at a Kamala Harris, there are not limits that come to you because you went to an HBCU. I, I have, there are lots of things in my life that I regret, but I will never regret and have never regretted going to Howard University. And I, I don't believe that I would be sitting here talking to you with a book right now if I had not went to Howard University. It was um, the best decision that I could have made at that age. And, and I am so grateful that my mother, who had her doubts, I think she was more worried about me going to D.C. <laughs> uh, I'm so grateful that she allowed me to go. Um, and didn't push back on it. And so that's what I would say to any parent who has concerns. And there may be some high school teachers or counselors who are on this call. How can they help introduce or um, encourage if the student wants to, but how do they expose students to HBCUs? Yeah, and I always say it's such a deeply personal choice. Not everybody's going to go to an HBCU, but I think, um, you know, and not that, you know, just to push the book, I think the HBCU made is a good introduction and a small slice where people who are, where kids who are interested can learn about what it is like to go to an HBCU. What I would say to, you know, um, teachers and ad administrators and people who are in touch with students is just to tell them that, you know, HBCUs are an option and to let them know about some of the, the many people who they know about um, who've gone to HBCUs, whether it's to Raji P. Henson or Anthony Anderson or, you know, so on and so forth, Oprah Winfrey's. And, and all the, the list um, that goes on and on of people who have gone to HBCUs and what they're doing with their lives. Um, and I think just kind of opening the door. I, I always think I got kids and, and I know you have a child. And, and if you push too hard, they're going to say, no, this is, <laughs> you know, they're going to think it's not cool. Oh, okay. you, you cannot, you cannot act thirsty. I'm no, right. I'm don't like, act. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, you won't like Howard. I don't think you <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can't push too yeah. hard, but just like, let them know it's out there and maybe let them feel like they're discovering it themselves. But yes, I, um. I think that's what I would say to to kind of just open the door to students um, and give them the option to kind of walk through it if they would like to. Yes, and you close the book with the commencement speech that Oprah Winfrey gave to her alma mater, Tennessee State University. Yeah. And, you know, like I say, I mean, if you can have Oprah in your book, you should have Oprah in your book. And so but she has a beautiful, um, you know, essay. It's, it's um, adapted from her commencement speech where she talks about going to Tennessee State um, and how, you know, there was a professor there who was very tough, but he was the one who convinced her father to allow her to take her first TV, uh, you know, her TV job. Um, and obviously the rest is history. And you see how going to Tennessee State 
um, impacted her life um, and, you know, made a difference in her life. And what I also love about ending the book with that is she's talking to the next generation. So she's talking to people who are graduating. And so somebody in that audience 25 years from now um, will likely be a person that we're talking about, right? Who, who we're reading about because HBCUs are not um, a thing of the past. They didn't educate people in the past. Um, they have made history and they continue to make history. They've trained leaders and they are training leaders um, and that they are institutions of today and deserve to be supported and celebrated today. Voila. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Natalie, uh, an excellent interview, conversation, not interview, actually, conversation, loved it. Um, loved the vibe, loved the chemistry between the two of you. I know, I'm sure everyone had um, a great time listening in on this conversation. Um, I want to remind everybody that both Natalie and Aisha are going to be part of After Hours that's going to start at 8.05 Central. That's in about eight minutes from now. They're going to answer questions. You can come hang out, uh, find out more, pick the brains of these two brilliant women, find out what more you want to know about HBCUs, maybe what you want to know about journalism uh, in general as well. I'm sure they're happy to answer a couple other questions along those lines. How do you get to come to After Hours? Buy a copy of this incredible book, HBCU Made, from our partner bookseller, which is an indie bookseller. There you go. Uh, we put the link in chat, buy a copy from the bookstall. In the receipt you get from the store is a link to register for After Hours. And Fan is giving everyone who comes to After Hours a second copy of the book. It could be for perhaps your child's school library. It could be for a family member. It could be for uh, your workplace. It could be for whoever you feel needs to or would love to have a second copy of this book. What a great deal. Come support this book. Support this incredible author and her work. Um, we're thrilled to be hosting you, and thank you so much. Uh, we're at 7.58. we got about two minutes. There's a question that was submitted um, be, uh, through the registration um, form that I'd like to pose to you because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, and this woman uh, asked from Evanston, she says, upon starting your first year, what apprehension or worries did you have, if any, about attending an HBCU? Um, if so, what was your apprehension rooted in and was it relieved? So maybe a little bit, what were your worries about going? I think my worries about going, and I don't know that they were specific to an HBCU, but I think I, I was worried about fitting in. I think, you know, and this might sound a little strange, but, you know, going to a school where everyone is Black, um, I, I felt like I wanted... <laughs> I didn't want to be absolutely disliked. If I went to a school where there were white people, I might be like, you know, I could fit in or not fit in. But it's like, I don't want my own people <laughs> to be looking at me like, why are you staying? You know, who is this chick? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that um, were they assuaged? Were my worries assuaged? Um, I think that they they were in the sense that I, I survived. Like I, I think that I was always nervous. I was always scared. Um, and and but what happened was I was able to make it, and I realized, you know, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can survive. Maybe I can fit in. Maybe I can make friends. Um, and that I was stronger than I thought I was. Love that. Well, thank you so much for a great night. We have, we're just about out of time. I hope everyone comes and hangs out at After Hours. Um, there's so much more to learn. So thank you so much, Aisha, for making FAN part of your book tour. We're very honored to be hosting you. Natalie, we just love you, love your work. So glad that you're not only in our immediate geographic area, but you just, you bring so much heart and brains to your to your work. And we just, we're very, very grateful to you. You always make everything thank more you. better. So thank you so much for that. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Hope to welcome you back to Fanland very soon. And good night. We Maybe we'll see some of you in about five minutes. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night. Bye.